To know that you are ignorant is best. To know what you do not is a disease. But if you recognize the malady of mind for what it is, then that is health. In a way, the origin of Western philosophy can almost be traced back to one day in ancient Greece when an Athenian by the name of Chaerophon travelled to Delphi to visit the Temple of Apollo. The reason for his visit was the temple's high priestess Pythia, who is widely known as the Delphic Oracle. This illustrious figure was said to be a vessel for the god Apollo, thus having enthusiasmos or spirit. Consequently, she was highly sought after for her prophecies. Now Chaerophon, like most revering the authority and prestige of the oracle, had travelled all the way to Delphi to ask her a simple question. Is there any man in Athens wiser than Socrates? The oracle, when this was put to her, responded, no, there are none wiser than Socrates. Now this answer greatly troubled him when it was relayed to him, for he believed that this could not possibly be the case. There were plenty in Athens, thought Socrates, who certainly seemed wiser than he. Poets for one, rhetoricians such as Protagoras, artisans, statesmen, even prophets like Euthyphro. So Socrates went about at disproving the oracle's statement. But as he began questioning the professedly wise men of Athens, he began to realise that Pythia had been correct. Although these men purported to possess knowledge of their disciplines, they in fact knew very little at all. So what exactly happened during these conversations for Socrates to draw such a, a radical conclusion? Surely not a debate, because Socrates believed these men exceedingly better versed than himself, so a debate would be futile. Instead, the discussions, which are later retold as dialogues by Socrates' student Plato, took a dialectical form. Here meaning a discussion in which the participants solely rely on spoken reason, or logos, to retain the truth rather than heeding rhetoric or emotional appeals, for instance. Socrates approaches each discussion from a place of irony, and this Socratic irony, as the 19th century Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard would later call it, is an invitation for the interlocutor, or conversation partner, to hold court on the subject. After all, they're the proclaimed experts on their field, so they would be best suited to educate Socrates on these matters. Essentially, Socratic irony is the use of flattery, or by some accounts sarcasm, to prompt the other person into explaining what they think is the case. An excellent example can be found at the beginning of the Platonic dialogue Euthyphro, where Socrates encounters the eponymous prophet and becomes interested in the fact that Euthyphro is prosecuting his own father. Euthyphro maintains that it is the pious or godly thing to do. Socrates compliments him on the direction of his piety, and says, ironically, it is indeed most important, my admirable Euthyphro, that I should become your pupil. Now, some might say that this is insincere, but let us remember that Socrates is presuming that the wise men of Athens are to be believed when it comes to their expertise. Who better than Euthyphro to help attain a good understanding of the gods? After this encouragement, Euthyphro makes a comment about the nature of piety, which allows Socrates to now ask, So tell me now, by Zeus, what you just now maintained you clearly knew. What kind of thing do you say godliness and ungodliness are? The irony here was necessary in facilitating the discussion, and therefore evaluating Euthyphro's position. The scholar Gregory Vlastos identifies this as the first stage of the Socratic method, which in ancient Greek is called Elenchus. Where were we? Oh yes, Socrates asks Euthyphro to explain the nature of godliness, and Euthyphro nonchalantly responds that him prosecuting his father, and pretty much stuff like that, are the are piety. Now of course this reply fails to answer the question, doing very little to reveal the nature of piety, instead only offering an example of it. But don't worry, Socrates sees through this and sharply holds him to an answer. Now finally Euthyphro asserts, what is holy is that what is dear to the gods. Great, so this leads to the second Elenchic stage, as discerned by Vlastos. Socrates identifies a claim and determines its veracity. The way he does so is always through clarification. So he says, The thing and the person that are dear to the gods are holy, and the thing and the person that are hateful to the gods are unholy, he recaps carefully. The holy and the unholy are the exact opposites of each other. Is this not what we have said? And Euthyphro ascends and goes, Yes, 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 yes. Well then, Socrates continues, have we said this also, that the gods Euthyphro quarrel and disagree with each other, and that there is enmity between them? Euthyphro agrees again, yes, we have said that. Now this here is a process of maietics, or philosophical midwifery, 
as it is described by Plato in the dialogue The Theotetus. The idea of the technique is that by coercing the interlocutor to agree with a series of subsequent statements, Socrates draws out the truth. And this maiatic encouragement is what Vlastos distinguishes as the third stage of Elenchus. Now the fourth stage, by the way, is where Socrates turns up the heat, because it's here that he implies that the subsequent statements are contrary to the original statement. Let us again defer to the Euthyphro dialogue as a demonstration. Socrates gets Euthyphro to agree that in numerical disagreements, one turns to arithmetic to solve it, in dimensional disagreements, one turns to objective measurement, and that in the disagreements of mass, one can resort to weighing. The only disagreement that would cause animosity or rift must therefore be a matter without obvious resolution, matters of right and wrong. Yes, Socrates, Euthyphro agrees, these are the questions about which we should become enemies. The mad gadfly then queries, And how about the gods? Some of the gods too think some things are right or wrong, and noble or disgraceful, and good or bad, and others disagree, for they would not war with each other if they did not disagree about these matters. And Euthyphro confirms that this is a good summary once more. So Socrates continues, Yes, the gods in each group love the things which they consider good and right, and hate the opposites of these things. And Euthyphro yeah, confirms, this time a bit more laconically, but you say that some things are considered right by some of them and wrong by others, and it's because they disagree about these things. Yes, says Euthyphro. Then, as it seems, says Socrates, the same things are hated and loved by the gods, and the same things would be dear and hateful to the gods. Then the same things would be both holy and unholy, Euthyphro, according to the statement. I suppose so, Euthyphro admits. This whole exchange leads to this final concession, which itself is a poric, meaning embodying aporia, or doubt. At this juncture, it seems that the words of Robert Burns were correct. There is no such uncertainty as a sure thing. Although this is not the end of the dialogue, it does a good job at embodying the fifth and final stage of Elenchus, the demonstration that the original proposition was false. But what good has been done? What progress has been made, one might ask? Well, surely by pursuing such a methodology, one is further from the truth than we were at the start. But in fact, the exercise is not only eliminative, it's also constructive. From discounting what a thing is not, we grow closer as to what it is. As the great Francis Bacon opined, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if he will be content to begin with doubts, he shall end in certainties. Numerous Socratic dialogues showcase the Alenkis in action. I, for one, find Gorgias and the Republic particularly interesting. But at this point, I think it's important to address what we can learn from it. In my view, there's one main lesson. It's a lesson of intellectual modesty. In the Apology, Socrates says, Although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is. For he knows nothing and thinks that he knows, and I neither know nor think that I know. Now, from Socrates, we can learn to be humble with one's claims of knowledge. We learn to build philosophy from the bottom up, and always question things that are taken for granted, including one's own belief. Remember many a times hubris is the enemy of intellectual progress. The unexamined life is not worth living. And unfortunately, that is the end of the video. But if you've enjoyed it, please do drop a like. It's a great way of showing support for the channel. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the Polymath Paradise. It basically means that we can produce more content like this. And be sure to turn on the notification bell just so it will pop up whenever we release new content. Thank you again for watching.